Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and this is our free one-hour tutorial for the Canon 77D. I'm going to show you all the little bits about how to learn it, but you don't have to watch the whole thing. Look at the description, and you can skip forward past the stuff that you already know. At the end of the video, I also recommend some lenses and flashes, tripods, that kind of thing. So if you have gear-related questions, you can skip right to the end. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. It's free. We have lots of tutorials coming out. We have lots of new camera reviews. And every Thursdays, we look at your pictures live, so we'll give you feedback on your pictures. Hit that notification bell so YouTube actually tells you about it. And if you have a different camera, we have tutorials like this for more than 50 cameras. So visit sdp.io slash tutorial or give your friends this link if they have a camera. First, let's talk about how to get the lens on the camera. There's a little white dot and it lines up with the white dot here. So you line those two up and then you twist it clockwise and then twist it back and forth a little bit and make sure that it's on there solid. If you have a lens that's designed for full frame, it will have a little red dot on it, like this, and you'll line that up with the red dot here, put those together, and it clicks in exactly the same. Otherwise, the lens will work exactly the same. It just has a different colored dot, no big deal. The lens has a couple of different switches on it. The stabilizer, on, off, you will pretty much leave that on all the time. Even if it's on a tripod, it's generally okay to leave it on. And the other switch is AF or MF for autofocus or manual focus. I'll talk about manual focus a little bit later, but generally autofocus is going to work just great for you. Talking about the battery in here. Underneath here, there's a little switch that flips down to reveal the battery. If you're like me, you will always put the battery in the wrong way first, but don't worry, it will go in all the way, but it won't actually click. So if that happens, just flip it over. But you want the metal contacts there going into the camera and towards the center of the camera. And once it goes in, it'll click in all the way. This camera does not USB charge. So if you travel, you have to travel with your little battery charger and a power adapter if you're going to a different country. So be sure to do that. It also wouldn't hurt to get a second battery. If you're like me and you like to USB charge everything, I'm gonna recommend this USB battery charger. Uh, that you can pick up at this link. You'll see a link to gear that I find useful for this camera. It's only eight bucks and it means you don't have to travel with the bulky charger that comes with it. It's much smaller and you can charge it from a battery pack or your car or whatever. This camera has a memory card that is like your digital film. It is not like your smartphone that has the memory built in. You have to always have a separate card that you have to buy separately and put it in there. It is an SD card. You can just pull this little door back and then manually flip it open. And then when you put the SD card in, it'll click in place. To remove it, just push it in and it will pop out again. SD cards store different amounts of pictures, but anything in the range from 64 gigs up should be fine. A 32 gig card is okay too, but I definitely like to have a little more extra capacity because it's pretty easy to run out of space. I am going to re recommend a couple of different types of cards. The first is a cheap SD card. And if you're the type who just takes like one picture and then goes about your day, the cheap SD card should probably be fine. If you're shooting sports or something else, like click, 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 then you will not want to get the cheap SD card. You want to get the next SD card I recommend. Either way, I recommend you head over to this link here, sdp.io slash cheap SD, and just buy buy three or four of the cheapest $8, $5 SD cards you can and scatter them about your world. Like put one in your glove box of your car, put one in your office desk, put one in your purse. That way, when you inevitably fill up or forget your SD card, you'll have an extra one. And a cheap SD card is better than no SD card, right? If you want to pause the video, you can look at this slide, which has a long testimonial from somebody who took my advice and it ended up saving their whole photo shoot. If you're shooting sports, wildlife, action, or you're just taking a lot of shots and you want the best performance out of your camera, I suggest getting a, a, this particular SD card, the SanDisk Extreme Pro. You can buy more expensive SD cards, but you won't get any extra performance out of them. This is the fastest card you can get for this camera. The 64 gig version is about 36 bucks. You can pick it up at that link. Let's talk about the ports on the camera. Over on the left side of the camera here, you'll see a couple of different ports. This one at the front of the camera is for the remote control and a microphone. You can hook up an external shotgun mic that you can put here. If you're recording video, that will greatly improve your sound. This remote control, I'll recommend a remote control later. We can use that as a remote shutter trigger for taking time lapses or long exposures. Let's flip this door open here, and you'll see at the top you have a USB port here. Um, you can use this to transfer pictures from your camera to your computer. 
However, I always find it easier to just take the memory card out and put it in the memory card slot that's built into most computers or an external SD card reader that tends to be way, way faster and a little bit easier than trying to find this particular USB cable, which is a little outdated. Again, it does not charge through that USB port. The port below it is a mini HDMI port. You could use this in theory to hook it up to your TV and then have like a slideshow on your TV, but nobody really does that. If you want to show pictures to your friends, you'd probably just show them on the back of the camera and then pass it around the room. Now, let's get into actual picture taking here. I'm going to flip out the rear screen here. It just flips out from the side. And then if you want to collapse it, you can twist it 180 degrees and flip it back. So now you can see the screen at all times. I'll turn the camera on with the switch over here. Just go from off to on. You can see this particular switch actually has three positions, the last one being video. So if you want to suddenly switch to video, do that. But this middle position on is for stills. You can take pictures either like a smartphone where you hold the camera out like this and look at the back of the screen, or you can take pictures more like a more traditional, what we call an SLR, where you hold the camera up to your eye and you look through the viewfinder. You'll have a very different experience depending on which one of these you do. If you learn photography on a smartphone, you'll probably take pictures out like this because this is what everybody does. If you want to do that, after you have the camera on, you'll push this little camera button here. Just push it once and you'll hear a little sound, it'll flip open. And now you'll be able to see what's going on through the screen here. Focusing is as simple as touching the screen. And then when you're ready to take the picture, just use the shutter up here, push it down all the way and click to take the picture. Now you can change what touching actually does. If you look at the lower left corner here, push that and you can switch from touch to focus to touch shutter. So now if I wanna take a picture and focus in one step, I'll just push it, touch it once, and it actually takes the picture for me. When you're using this back of the screen, what we call live view mode, things are a little bit different. It's nice because you can focus anywhere in the frame and take a picture, edge to edge. But focusing is a little bit slower, especially for things like sports. If you need fast focusing, you should push this button again so that goes away and put the camera up to your eye and use this viewfinder. This viewfinder seems a little primitive because it has like kind of 1980s LCD displays going on in there. It's not as nice as your smartphone display. But what you're seeing is the real world in real time and the focusing is going to be almost instantaneous. So definitely use this anytime you want to shoot action. This does not have a digital display. If you need to review your pictures, it's always going to be on the back of the camera. You can't review your pictures in here. This is just for taking pictures. Um, you also cannot shoot video. If I put it into video mode, and I put this up to my eye, it's black. And that confuses some people. Video is only on the back screen. If you have it in live view mode for still photos, you also cannot use the viewfinder. So just know this camera kind of has two distinct personalities between the optical viewfinder and the live view screen on the back. And you have to be aware of those as you switch back and forth. They can be a little disorienting for people the first week or two as they use their camera. So let's talk about how to take a picture with the viewfinder. The first time you turn the camera on, this mode is probably going to be in the green mode here. And you'll put the camera up to your eye and push the shutter button down halfway. Now at this point, my flash popped up because it's kind of dim. If I push the shutter button down halfway, the camera wakes up and it looks for anything in the frame that it can focus on. If I push it all the way down, it will actually take the picture. This works okay. We'll talk about ways to pick a specific focusing point and how to control this flash in just a little bit. That's the basic of it. Halfway to focus, all the way down to take the picture. While you're looking through the viewfinder, you can see an info level in the lower left corner if you decide to turn this option on. And I find it really useful because I, I, all my pictures are always a little bit off level. So now I'm going to go into the menu system and show you how to turn that info level on. Press the menu button, go to the wrench icon, page two, and then go down to viewfinder display. Now for the first option here, electronic level, you can select show. Now you can see there's a little icon in the lower left corner that will allow you to see when your camera is actually level or a little bit off level. That little thing can do a lot to improve your photography. As you're using the viewfinder, uh, you might not have perfect vision or you might have perfect vision. And when you look through the viewfinder, suddenly everything is a little bit blurry. You can 
fix both of those problems by using the diopter. The diopter dials in a glasses prescription into your viewfinder. It's this little tiny dial right here. And the way you'll use it is you'll put the camera up to your eye and push the shutter button down halfway so you can see the numbers on the bottom of the screen. And then don't look through the lens, but look at those numbers and dial the diopter up and down until it's as sharp as it can possibly be. This way you can take off your glasses and hold it directly to your eye and not have to hold it away from yourself against the and against your glasses. Now, the problem with that is if you trade the camera between multiple people, you might have different glasses prescriptions, so you might have to regularly dial it in. Uh, and if it gets ha hit accidentally, everything will seem blurry, and people think that their camera just isn't focusing, but be sure to check that diopter, and again, look at the numbers on the bottom of the screen. Let's talk about how to take a picture using Live View at the, at the back of the camera here, people's kind of favorite way to do it. Again, you'll push this button here to display things in live view, and you can just touch to either focus or touch to actually take a picture depending on what that setting is. You have lots of different options for how for what's displayed on the screen here, and if you want to cycle through it, just hit the info button here in the upper left corner. You can see as I push it, it's showing or hiding different bits of information. This one is particularly useful because it's showing you a histogram. The histogram shows the brightness of different parts of the screen. So you can see here that there's a big spike near the right side of the screen, and that's indicating that there's a bunch of really bright white in the picture. If you look, this picture has spikes at the left, in the middle, and on the right, and that's because if part of the picture is black, part of it is kind of in the middle, and then part of it is bright white. The camera will like go to sleep on its own, so you might occasionally have to either interact with it or just go through the process of waking it back up. That's just kind of how it works, and every time you do wake it back up, you'll have to push that button again to get it into Live View. It won't automatically use Live View for you. So now that I'm in here, I can easily touch to take a picture, or I can use the shutter up here. Pushing it halfway will focus wherever I've selected the focusing point to be, and then pushing it all the way will take the picture. This flips out, which is super convenient. It flips out like this so that you can kind of take a selfie. You can actually see yourself. Let's see if we can actually do this. Ooh, my head is big. This is also really useful if you're filming somebody else, you can flip it around and show them the composition. You can also use this and tilt it down like this. So that way, if I want to take a picture over my head, I can do it like this and I can actually shoot over crowds. Or if I want to take a picture of a flower or something close to the ground, a puppy, perhaps I have a new puppy, I can hold it out like this and get really low to the ground and that way I don't have to get on my hands and knees and get everything dirty. After you take a picture, you can review it on the back screen. It'll automatically review it for you by default. Hit the play button here to see your last taken pictures. Oh, look at that guy. And from here, it's actually a pretty intuitive camera. You can just zoom in like this and kind of pan around. You can also push back to actually see thumbnails like that, pick a different picture, and then even just swipe through the different pictures. So this operates pretty intuitively, kind of just like your cell phone. And just like before, I can hit the info button here to show or hide different information. Pressing it once showed me some of my settings, like my shutter speed, my aperture, my ISO, and I can push it again and actually see my histogram to review my exposure. It's a good idea after you take pictures to review them. And if it's important, an important picture, definitely zoom in and make sure that you nailed focus. Uh, here it actually missed focus a little bit. That way, you can take a picture again before you before it's too late to capture the moment. Uh, if you hate a picture that you took, you can delete it by hitting the trash can button here and then just pushing erase. And then it's pretty much gone forever. Now let's talk about the different camera modes. This is your mode dial here in the upper left part of the camera and it has a lot of different modes. These are going to make a huge difference in your photography once you figure out how to use these. If you ever feel overwhelmed, go green. Just switch this back to the little green A button here, and that means the camera will go into super easy mode. It's doing all the thinking for you. This is great. Pros will often use automatic settings just because it allows them to focus on things like the composition and the lighting, the storytelling, all these aspects of, uh, all the art artistic aspects of photography that really make more of a difference than just the aperture and f-stop and shutter speed that you've dialed in, so don't be afraid to just go green if you're feeling overwhelmed. But I am going to show you what the actual modes do. Now, these with the little pictograms here, like the little head or the mountains or the flower or the little running guy, those are pretty self-explanatory, right? 
So I'm not going to walk you through those. Those automatic modes are useful. Pick the running guy if you're shooting sports. Pick the head if you're shooting portraits. Pick the mountains if you're shooting landscapes. That's all okay. But at some point, I want you to get advanced enough that you're thinking about the camera settings deliberately because anytime you put the camera in charge of picking the settings, it's going to screw it up some portion of the time. So the main camera modes that you'll be using are these four up here inside this little bracket. And the first one I'll talk about is P mode. P is for program mode, and it has the camera do all automatic settings. Now, they're automatic, just like the green mode, but P mode gives you more control. The first thing it does is it actually gives you access to more menus. You can see if I hit the menu button in P mode under the wrench icon here, I have five pages. If I switch back to the green mode, and hit the menu button. Now I just have four pages. So the green button kind of simplifies the camera and takes away some things that at some point you're going to find useful. So for that reason, I never really go to the green mode. I more use the program mode. Program mode still allows you to adjust the shutter speed and aperture. You can see as I activate the camera here, it's picking both the shutter speed and the aperture for me, but I can easily change that by moving the main dial here. So you can see by doing that, I'm actually adjusting those settings. So you can still take manual control of what you want your settings to be. If you want to control the background blur in a subject, you're going to switch over to AV mode. AV mode stands for aperture priority, and it allows you to dial up more or less background. For me, day-to-day -day shooting, I usually have the camera in aperture priority mode, and I let the camera think about things like the ISO and the shutter speed, and I just focus on that one setting. We'll talk about aperture in just a minute. If you want, are shooting action, and you want to control how much movement there is in the frame, then you'll switch into TV mode, which stands for time value, but most people call it shutter priority. That's great. And if you get serious, if you're shooting in a studio or you're doing night photography or you just want to control both your shutter speed and your aperture, you're going to be in manual mode, which is symbolized by the capital M there. Now let's talk about each of those modes in a little more detail. But first, a word from our sponsor, who is me. I wrote some books about photography and I'd like you to check them out. Uh, that's how we make these sort of tutorials possible. The first book I'd like to show you is Stunning Digital Photography. It's the number one photography book in the world. Go to Amazon or wherever you shop for books and search for Stunning Digital Photography and you'll see it has over 2,000 reviews with an average five-star rating. It's not just a boring book, but it has videos, over 14 hours of video in it. It has practices, hands-on practices that you can use. It has quizzes you can take just to make sure that you're on track. And you can join a Facebook group with people just like yourself learning photography. And they will give you useful feedback on your pictures and it can make a world of difference. The ebook is under 10 bucks, so it's pretty cheap. And if you're not happy with it, I'll give you your money back, I promise. There's, there's also a paperback. Um, and if you get into post-processing, I use Lightroom. Most people use Lightroom. I have a book on Lightroom. I have a book on Photoshop if you get a little more serious. I also have a photography buying guide which tells you like which lenses and flashes are best for different situations. You can go to Amazon and search for Tony Northrup or visit our store at sdp.io slash store. We ship worldwide. Thanks. Let's talk a little bit more about aperture, aperture priority. The aperture is the iris in the lens. It's just like the iris in your eye, it gets big when you're in a dark room or it can narrow down when you're out in bright sun. Besides just choosing how much light comes in, the aperture controls the effect of the background. Looking at this slide, we see three pictures taken at different aperture values. Aperture is measured in what's called f-stops and it's really confusing. <laughs> f1.8 means it's a, like a big wide opening. And high f-stop numbers like f22 are little small openings. And that's confusing, but you can think of it as a fraction. It's like 1 over 1.8 is bigger than 1 over 22. Okay. But the actual effect of it is more or less background blur. So if you look at the picture on the left here, that's my wife Chelsea in New York. And you can see the background is completely blurred out. So it focuses your attention as the viewer of the photo just on the subject. It eliminates all the distractions by making it nice and blurry. There's still some context, but it doesn't tell a complete story. At f8, you can see the background starts to come into focus. And now you get more of a sense like, hey, this person's in an alley in New York. And if you use a high f-stop number like f22, you can see the background now becomes very sharp. And you can make out the individual details of people walking and cars. These pictures, they all have their different merits. This tells m more of a story of somebody being in New York and it provides all this extra information, but all that background 
detail actually detracts from the main subject in a portrait. So depending on the type of picture you take, you might choose different f-stop values. And that's the wonderful thing about photography is you as a photographer making these choices. And that's why I want to get you into aperture priority mode. If you want to learn everything about aperture, a lot of detail, visit this free video at sdp.io slash f-stop where I will blow your mind with the amount of detail about aperture priority. Anyway, now that you've got the camera into AV mode here, if you want to adjust the aperture, all you're going to do is just turn your main dial here. So you can see right here is showing me the f-stop number. I can just move it to the right to pick a higher f-stop number, or I can move it to the left to pick a lower f-stop num number, blurring my background more. In most situations, you're just going to always pick the lowest f-stop number. If you're unsure, Go for the lowest f-stop number. It's only if you decide you're getting too much background blur that you'll want to add that extra context in. Now, the kit lens that came with your camera is not going to give you this amount of background blur. You can, for about a hundred bucks, you can get the Canon 50 millimeter f1.8 STM, this, this lens right here, and it really will blur the background just about that much, and it's a really cool effect. So if you're interested in those techniques, you might consider checking that out. I'll, I'll give you a link a little bit later in the video. Besides adjusting it with the dial, which is usually the most easy way to do it, you can also touch the Q button down here in the lower left corner, hit Q, and then touch that, and then you can just slide it with your finger. This might be useful if, for example, you're holding it at arm's length and you can't quite reach the dial. Just a second way to do exactly the same thing. Now, as you're shooting, you might want to actually see how much background blur you're going to get. And just to create that extra background blur, I'm going to switch out lenses and put on this 50 millimeter f1.8 so we can really see some background blur. And now I'm going to put on live view mode here. And so here you can see I'm focusing on the screen. And as I look in the background here, you can see this is a chair and it's now completely out of focus, right? Even if I crank the f-stop up to f22, it remains completely out of focus. If I want to get a preview of how much aperture, how much depth of field, how much background blur I'm going to get, I'm going to hit the depth of field preview button, which is this button on the front of the camera right, right below the lens release. I'll just push that like that. And you can actually hear the lens shutting down. You can see, can you see that iris going like that? Every time I push the depth of field preview button, it shuts down. Pretty cool, right? You got that? You can see? Okay. Now, looking at the back of the screen, looking at the back of the screen as I hit the depth of field preview button, look, that chair just snaps into focus. It's not focusing in a different place. All it's doing is shutting down the aperture to give me a preview of it. Now, I'm showing you this in live view mode. If you want to use the viewfinder and do depth of field preview, you can do that, but you're going to be a little shocked because the screen will suddenly get very, very dark. That's because the iris is getting really small. And the viewfinder is just like a telescope. It's just bouncing light directly to your eye. So it's cutting down almost all the light. Live view makes up for that by making it much brighter. Now let's talk about shutter priority. Controlling the aperture is really useful. But you, there are going to be times when you'd rather just control the shutter speed. When you take a picture, the shutter opens and then closes really, really quickly. Usually at like 1 60th of a second or even faster. And it seems like it happens instantaneously, but there's definitely a period of time while it's open. And if something is moving fast enough that it travels over multiple pixels during that period of time, then it's going to end up blurry in the picture, for better or worse. Sometimes this is a great effect and sometimes it's going to ruin your pictures. Let's take a look at an example. These are three pictures that I took of my daughter. We're on one of those spinny things in the playground. She was a little kid at the time. In the first picture, I had the shutter speed at one eighth of a second, which is a slow shutter speed. And you can see the background blurred a bunch. The second picture, we're moving at the same speed still, but it's taken at one thirtieth of a second. And you can see there's a lot of detail in the background now. You can make out the bars and the posts that were just completely blurred before. That's because we didn't travel nearly as far in one thirtieth of a second as we did in one eighth of a second, and therefore things just aren't as blurry. In the final shot here at one one twenty fifth, the shutter is four times faster, and though we're still moving, everything is frozen. So if you're taking a picture of something in the background, of course you wouldn't want it to be all blurry. But if you're intentionally trying to show that nice blur you get from panning like you do in every professional car magazine, then you'd want to use a slow shutter speed like that. And that's a time when you'd want to bust out TV, old shutter priority mode. If you want to know everything about shutter priority, visit sdp.io shutter. I will give you a hint. You don't always want to pick 
a super fast shutter speed. You almost never want to pick a super fast shutter speed. For me, if I'm shooting like my kids' sports, I'm probably at like 1 250th or she's older now, 1 400th. If you're shooting like high school or college sports, it might be like 1 500th or if you get close to the subjects, it might even be faster like 1 1000th or 1 2000th. So once we're in TV mode, you'll control the shutter using the dial on the camera here. So as I adjust this up, you can see the shutter speed there is getting higher and higher, all the way up to 1 4000th, the maximum shutter speed. If I scroll to the left, it's going to get slower and slower. Now we're at one full second. See what that sounds like as I take a picture. See, pretty slow shutter. And then as I keep going to the left, now we're talking multiple seconds. That's a 25 second exposure, all the way up to a 30 second exposure, which is the maximum shutter speed you can do without switching to bulb mode, which I'll talk about in just a second. I don't want to leave it at 30 seconds. That'd be really annoying. As before, you can hit the Q button down here and then dial this up or down with your finger. I'd also like to point out that this camera has a nice top screen. Sometimes you're holding the camera on a strap around your neck. You can see these same numbers here on that little top LCD screen. And if you're having a hard time seeing it, this button here with the light bulb actually lights it up to make it a little easier. So there you can see this number on the left is showing the shutter speed. That's showing the aperture. This is the number of shots remaining. But for day-to-day -day shooting, you can probably be at 1 60th. But I have way more information at that free video there. Now let's talk about manual mode. There are going to be times when you figure out what f-stop you want to get the background blur you need. And then you think, I also need to control the shutter speed to show a certain amount of movement in my shots. Perfect time to use manual mode. I'll just put the shutter, I'll just put the dial here on M. To get yourself into manual mode, switch the mode dial over to M. Now you'll control the shutter speed using the same dial you did before, your main dial. If you want to control the aperture, you'll use the secondary dial, which is this dial right here. So you can see as I scroll to the right, my f-stop goes up. As I scroll to the left, it goes down. Main dial here, still adjusting the shutter speed, just like it did in shutter priority mode. Now I'm controlling both of those things. This uh, doesn't necessarily change the brightness of your image, though, because it's not just the shutter speed and the aperture that control the brightness of your image, it's also the ISO and we'll talk about that just in a bit. But right now I'm in auto ISO mode, so the camera's handling that for me automatically. If you put the camera into live view mode, you can preview these settings in real time. I'm gonna hold down that depth of field preview button that I just showed you, and you can see, as I dial the aperture up, you can see everything gets darker, but at the same time everything also gets sharper. That's because the aperture is closing down and down and down and letting in less and less light to the point where the camera can't compensate anymore by adjusting the ISO up. With the shutter speed, you don't really see any particular difference as you adjust it, unless things are getting darker. Like it's not trying to freeze the action for you. But as I go to up to 1 4,000th of a second in this moderately dim environment, you can see that the chair just disappears and everything gets black. If I go to a slower and slower shutter speed, at some point it's actually going to be overexposed. Everything is blown out and white now. If you want to figure out how to actually dial in the perfect settings in manual mode, check out my free video here at stp.io slash go manual. Now let's talk about ball mode. I showed you earlier that the maximum this camera will go to is 30 seconds. If you're in manual mode, you can actually activate bulb mode, which will allow it to go for 10 minutes or however long you want. It's called bulb mode because back in the days you hooked up this like remote shutter trigger and it was actually a bulb, like you would squeeze this bulb. I don't know why they can't rename it, or I don't know why they don't just let you dial in longer numbers. But anyway, the maximum amount you can do is 30 seconds. So to activate ball mode, you'll be in manual mode. And then you'll just scroll left with the shutter speed, the main dial here. And once you get to 30 seconds, you'll go one more tick, and now it will say bulb. And the way this is going to work is in bulb mode, the shutter stays open for as long as you have your finger on the shutter. So I'll hold this down. And if I hold it down for a split second, the shutter stays open for only a split second. If I hold my finger here for 20 minutes, it will stay open for 20 minutes and give me a really overexposed picture because it's not that dim in this room. But you probably don't want to stand there for 20 minutes with your finger on the shutter, right? Good news, this camera has a second menu that you can go into to control how long bulb mode is going to be. So after you put your camera into manual mode, you move the shutter all the way to the left to go into bulb mode. Now you'll go into the menu system you go to the camera tab, page five, and then you'll see bulb timer, the second option here, and you can select enable. 
And now what you can do is you can dial that value up or down and you'll hit enable. To dial the actual exposure time, you'll hit the info button. See it says info detail set. So push that. And so now I can go in and set it to say one minute even. And now I'll click OK. And now it's showing bulb timer one minute. So what this means is now that the bulb timer is set to one minute, I can go out here and if I push the shutter button now, it will stay open for one full minute. So that's great news. You don't need an external shutter trigger to take long exposures. I'm sorry that you have to go through this kind of convoluted thing where you have to go into the menu systems and select bulb mode, but nonetheless, it actually works. If you want to end bulb mode earlier, just push the shutter button and it'll pop out of it. Now let's talk about the different shutter modes. By default, when you get your camera, uh, I'm going to put it back into P mode just to make my life easy. When you get your camera and you hold down the shutter button, it takes just one picture. That's fine for day-to-day -day shooting, it's okay. But if you're shooting your kid's soccer game, you probably want to like take five or 10 pictures or even more, and you want the camera to just shoot continuously. It's like the difference between automatic and semi-automatic, right? So let's put this thing into automatic shutter where I'll just take a bunch of pictures. The easiest way to do that is, and the square box here in the bottom row, I'm gonna select that, tap it again, and now I'm going to switch it to continuous high-speed shooting. So with that selected, when I hold the shutter button down, there we go. It's gonna take a bunch of pictures and then at some point, I'm going to run out of buffer where it's taken all the pictures it can store and it will start to really slow down. But that point is a long time off, at least when you're shooting JPEG. We'll talk about RAW versus JPEG in a second. But you can see, I can take a whole bunch of pictures and that's going to really improve my odds of getting a good shot. Honestly, I keep it in continuous high-speed shutter all the time. Even if I'm taking portraits, I like to rattle off three pictures at least because if you take just one picture, there's a pretty good chance somebody's going to have a weird smile or they're going to be blinking and digital pictures don't cost anything. So rattle off three, five, ten pictures and then just pick the best one of those and I promise that's a really easy way to just improve your photography. Now there are some other shutter modes between single, besides just single shutter and continuous shutter. So let's hit that Q button again. Sometimes you have to kind of wake the camera up. Here we go. Okay, I got the Q button. Let's touch that. Besides high speed continuous, there's also just low speed continuous. If you're like, whoa, that's way too fast. Slow down, Tony. Put it in low speed continuous and now it's like, okay, maybe that's more your pace. I'm a high speed continuous kind of guy. Call me crazy. You'll also see some delayed shutter modes here. This is a two second delayed shutter. If I push the shutter, it will wait two seconds and then it will take the picture. If you have the camera on a tripod and you want the sharpest picture possible, use that two second delay to prevent yourself from shaking the picture, shaking the camera while you actually push the shutter button. It's just gonna add that little bit of delay that will let the camera get all of its shake out of it before it takes the picture. So use it for tripod stuff. If you need a longer delay, hit that Q button, go into the shutter mode, and now you'll pick the last option here, which is the custom timer. This will wait 10 seconds and then take the number of pictures that you select here. So I find this super useful to set it to a higher value like eight. And now, after I push the shutter button, it's gonna wait 10 seconds, it'll blink, and then it will blink faster at the end, and then it will take the number of pictures I told it. That way, if there's one frame where people have their eyes closed, well, you'll pick the best one of those eight shots and one of them will probably work pretty well. After you're done changing your shutter mode to something weird, always remember to hit the Q button and go back in here and set it back to probably high speed continuous. If you're the type who would uh, rather use buttons than go in through the Q mode, you can also just push this dial to the right here and that will take you to the same thing. You can see there's a little icon there that's showing the stack of copies it looks like. That just does exactly the same thing. It takes you to that menu. It's a little easier for me just to remember to go into the touch screen. The camera also has multiple focusing modes. By default, it uses what's called AFS, which is single autofocus. And what will happen is, let's turn on live view here, set the focus there, and as I push the shutter button down halfway, it will focus once, and then the focus will freeze. So if I recompose the photo, you can see it's not refocusing. Everything just becomes blurry, except for the original thing that I focused on. AFS focuses once and then stops focusing, which makes it terrible for shooting action like sports where your kid's running towards you, right? Because by the time it focused on them and you push the, the trigger, 
your son would be in a different place and you would have missed the shot. For those situations, you want to switch to continuous autofocus called AFC. Just like before, the easiest way to get to it is to hit the Q button. Let's get out of live view here. Hit the Q button and hit the lower left corner here. It's one shot. Push it again, and now I can choose between one shot, AI focus, and AI servo. There's really no need to use AI focus. That allows the camera to pick whether you're going to do continuous or single autofocus. So instead, I pretty much always use AI servo, which is continuous focus. So as we do that, as we do that, if I'm looking through the viewfinder and I have my finger on the shutter button, it will continually refocus wherever I put the camera, which is perfect for sports. On this particular camera, the focusing system is so good that there's really no reason to use single autofocus. So I use uh, continuous autofocus AI servo all the time. All that stuff I just described applies to when you're using the viewfinder, which you should be for any type of action. Things work a little bit differently when you're focusing with live view, because as I said, it's actually like you have two completely different cameras, one in live view and one in the viewfinder. So to understand the live view mode, I'm gonna turn on live view here. And once again, I can control the focusing by pushing the Q button, but now the, the autofocus is in the upper left corner. So I can select that and then pick between three autofocus modes down here. The first one uses face tracking, and this is what you'll probably use most of the time. Because after all, you'll be taking pictures of people a lot, right? This will automatically find a face whenever possible, and if it doesn't find a face, it will just focus on whatever it finds, and you can take the picture. You can also choose AF, smooth zone AF, which will pretty much just focus in the middle of the frame. And if you have it in single focus, you can pick zone AF, which will just focus in the middle. The last option here is a single autofocus point, which allows you to more precisely pick an autofocus point. You can move that AF point around by touching the screen or by using the directional pad here to move it. But, you know, usually it's going to be easier just to touch the screen. Besides choosing how the camera focuses in live view, you can uh, also select between single autofocus and continuous autofocus. It is the option right below that first one. It's the second option down. So right now it's selected as one shot, which is single autofocus. I can also select servo, which is continuous autofocus. And as you can see, as I push the shutter button down halfway, if I whip over the screen, it will try to get it into focus. Now, it's pretty good. But still, it's not nearly as good as using the viewfinder for tracking focus. So if you are shooting sports, just go ahead and hold it up to your eye. But nonetheless, it can actually get the job done. Uh, I showed you how to change the focusing point in live view already, but now I'll show you how to do it with the viewfinder. So let's turn live view off here. The easiest thing to do is to first change your focusing point selection mode. If you look, hit the Q button here, this option here Right now, it's set to auto selection AF, which means the camera will look at all the autofocus points spread across the entire frame, and the camera decides what to focus on. And usually, it's going to focus on the first thing that it finds. It's not smart enough to really like see a face in when you're using the viewfinder and lock onto it. That only works in live view mode. And as a result, I don't like to just let the camera pick where to autofocus. Instead, I like to tell it where to autofocus because, you know, I'm the person with the brain, right? So I always use manual selection one point AF. I just leave it on this point all the time. And once I've selected that, I can then choose different AF points by moving the directional pad. Now, you can also change the autofocus point while the camera is up to your eye. To do that, you'll have to push this button here. This is the autofocus point selection button. You can see it's marked with like a little grid line there. So I'll put it up to my eye. I'll push that button. I'll wake the camera up. I'll push that button. And then now I can select the autofocus point here by using the directional pad. And when I'm ready, I can just push the shutter button down to take the picture. Now let's talk about manual focus. There's very few scenarios where you want to manually focus, but maybe you're doing night photography or macro photography, or maybe you just want to experiment with manual focus. During those times, you'll want to just switch the lens from AF to MF. Now, uh, I'll put it in live view mode so you can see it a little easier. Now I'm going to turn the focusing ring on this lens. This lens and your kit lens have two rings. One is for zoom, which pulls you closer or pushes you further away. And the other here at the edge is for focusing. But different lenses have different types of focusing rings. So you can see as I turn that, it goes in and out of autofocus. 
the annual focus is almost always less precise than autofocus. Still, there are times when you wanted to use it and I wanted to show you where it is. So when I'm done, I'm always going to switch it back to autofocus so that the next time I pick the camera up, it's ready to go. Now let's talk about ISO. It's spelled ISO as if it were an acronym, but it's not actually an acronym. And if you want to understand that and everything else about ISO, visit this link at sdp.io slash ISO. ISO behaves like it's adjusting your sensor's sensitivity to light. So picking a high ISO number, like ISO 6400, will allow you to shoot in near darkness. But while you're out in sunlight, you'll pick a low ISO number, like ISO 100, to get nice, clean, clear, and sharp images. If you shot film back in the days, it works exactly that same way. It's just like your ASA or ISO 100 film was good for sunny days, it always looked better than your high ISO film. By default, this camera is configured to automatic, automatically select your ISO for you, and that's usually the right choice. That's what I use most of the time. But there are times when you want to manually control the ISO. For example, if you're shooting at night or you're shooting in a studio with strobes, you'll want to set it. So I want to show you how to do that. First, I'll wake the camera up. There's a button for ISO here, so I could push that button, and that will pop it up here, and then I can just change it to the ISO I want, all the way up to ISO 25,600. Another way to select it is to hit the Q button here, and then select ISO in the upper left corner, Let's push it again, and now I can slide it up or down and pick whatever ISO speed I want. When you're done adjusting your ISO, pretty much put it back at auto ISO so that your camera's ready to shoot the next time you need to take a picture. If you take a picture and it ends up too dark or too bright, then you have total control over that, right? Sometimes the camera's just going to screw it up. If you take a picture of your friends and the sun is behind them, that bright sun is going to trick the camera's exposure system and make it underexpose the picture so that your friends' faces might be completely in shadow. You can fix that with exposure compensation. To adjust the exposure compensation on this camera, just turn this dial here, which will wake the camera up and then just adjust the dial up or down. So you can see as I roll it to the left, it's going to negative five. That means it's going to be five stops underexposed. It's going to be a much darker picture. If I roll it to the right, it's going to be a much brighter picture. You'll see this display also in the viewfinder here when you're using the viewfinder. But when you're using the viewfinder, you will not see a preview of what the picture is going to look like. If you want to see a preview of the picture, you have to use live view here by pushing this button. So now let's preview what it looks like. You can see my chair over there. Let's wake the camera up and then push this to the right. You can see it's getting much brighter. Here it's getting much darker. You can see the screen here. It's supposed to be white, but it's actually going to end up pretty dark even with exposure compensation in the middle. If I wanted those whites to be nice and bright, I'll move it to the right. And if you look at the histogram here, you can see how me changing the exposure compensation is also moving that histogram. That's a good way to kind of understand the histogram. Generally, what you'll do is just leave it in the middle. But if pictures are ending up too dark or too bright, don't be afraid to hit this dial at the back and adjust it up or down. This is definitely the easiest way to adjust the exposure compensation. But in live view, you can also just touch the exposure compensation dial here and then adjust it up and down. Or if you're out of live view, you can hit the Q button, touch the exposure compensation here, and then slide it up or down here. Now let's talk about bracketing. Back in the days of film, people used to bracket their shots because they never knew if they were going to get the exposure just right because we couldn't preview our pictures in real time. Bracketing takes multiple pictures at different exposures. So it'll take one at what the camera thinks is the right exposure, one that it thinks is too dark, and one that it thinks is too bright. And then when you got back to the dark room, you could pick the one that actually ended up being right. In the digital era, you can review your pictures and make sure that you nail it, so you don't really have to use bracketing very often. But some photographers still want to use bracketing to extend their dynamic range. I cover this in chapter 10 or chapter 11 of my book, Stunning Digital Photography. If you want to know more about that technique, it can really give you cool pictures and remove any noise that you might see in shadows, just improving the technical image quality. But you don't have to use it. <laughs> but I will show you how to use it. First, I'll hit the Q button here and then I'll touch the exposure compensation dial. This brings me to the screen I just showed you. But this screen actually has two modes, one for exposure compensation and one for bracketing. So if I want to do the bracketing, what I'll do is I'll increase this number here, either by touching this on the screen or by using the main dial. So you can see those little red lines indicate exposures. There's one line in the middle that indicates that the camera is going to take an exposure at the proper exposed value. and then 
always times out on me. And then this line here indicates that it's going to take an underexposed picture and then an overexposed picture. So we can see it's going to take three pictures. So let's get out of here and I'll show you what the effect of that is. Let's turn on live view. Let's focus on this and then I'm going to take three pictures. As we review those pictures, this is the first picture. That's what the camera thought was the right exposure. The second exp exposure is underexposed and then the third e exposure is overexposed. If I didn't know anything about exposure, I could just bracket all my shots and then later delete the two that were improperly exposed and pick my favorite one. In this case, it's going to be the overexposed shot. Or I could go into something like Adobe Lightroom and blend those photos together into an HDR shot. If you do want to check out Adobe Lightroom, my favorite post-processing app, heck, I wrote a whole book on it, go to sdp.io slash Adobe Deal and that will give you a free trial of it. It comes with Photoshop. It's pretty inexpensive to get. When you're done, shooting bracketing, I suggest going in and turning it back off so that the next time you pick up your camera, it's not taking three shots when you want it to take zero. So I'll just go back in and then get back out of that. Now let's talk about taking time lapses. Time lapses show a long period of time in a video clip by taking a picture every second or so. So that way in 10 seconds, you could show what an hour looked like. And it's just really cool. They use it a lot in TV and movies nowadays too. This camera takes excellent time lapses. There are a couple of different ways you can take time lapses. You can have it record a time lapse directly into a video file that's immediately ready to share. I'll show you that one first. To do that, I'll put the camera into video mode because we're going to be making a video file. Now I'll go into the menu here. I'll go to page five of the video menu here and I'll go down to time lapse movie and I'm going to select enable. And now I'm just going to select the settings that I need. You can see by default it's set up to take a picture every three seconds and it will take 300 pictures at 30 frames a second. That will give me about 10 seconds of video. So that's actually a pretty good place to start. I'll let you figure out all the intricacies of taking awesome time-lapse video. I just kind of wanted to show you how to do it on this camera. When I'm ready, I can hit the menu button here. And if I start a time-lapse, this is going to be a really boring time-lapse of my chair, but I'll just hit the shutter button to start it going. I'll hit the record button to start it going. And you can see where it beeped. That was one exposure. That was another exposure. So each of these are going to be one frame. If you're shooting at 30 frames a second, like most people do, then you will need 30 frames to make one second of video. If you're shooting at 60 frames a second or publishing at 60 frames a second, then you will need 60 frames to, to make one second of video. Nobody has ever complained about having too many photos for a time lapse, but lots of people complained that they didn't take enough pictures. So feel free to dial it down to shorter intervals or to take more shots because it's easy to squeeze it down to a shorter time lapse later. The second method for taking time lapse videos is to not record directly to a video file, but to take a series of high resolution still images and then use post processing software like Adobe Lightroom uh, to blend them into a video file later. To do that, put your camera back into stills mode. And now let's go into the menu here. And on the camera, page five, just like before, you'll see the first option here is interval timer. So I'll select that and then select enable. And, you know, oddly, I see a slightly different user interface here. It's doing almost the same thing, except it's taking still photos instead of making a video. To change the settings here, I need to hit the info button. And now I can go in and change the interval and the number of shots. And 10 shots is not nearly enough. You know, you'll probably need like 300 or something. So feel free to really crank that up until you get to unlimited. With unlimited, it's just going to go until you stop it. And that's pretty much what I will always do. So let's dial that down to like one second. Okay, there we go. One second is the shortest interval you can do. So with that activated, once I hit the shutter, you can see it's just going to take a picture every single time. You can see the camera is trying to focus between shots and that's not something you want. So before you start, if you want to stop it, you can just turn it off. Before you start taking a time lapse, I would definitely shift it into manual focus mode so that it doesn't have individual shots at different points in the time lapse. Now let's talk about the flash and the flash exposure compensation. This camera does have a flash on it. If you want to turn the flash on manually, hit this flash button. Well, first your camera has to be turned on. So turn your camera on and then hit the flash button and then it will pop up. And then once it's up, the next picture you take is going to fire the flash. If you have it in the green mode, it will pop up the flash automatically. And if you don't want that, you can push it down and it will turn it off. 
but we're more advanced than that, right? You're already working in program mode instead of the green mode, so you're gonna have to manually make the choice to turn the flash on. But who wants an unwanted flash, right? Just blinding people without any kind of warning. So you'll pop it up, and by default, it will take a picture with flash. Let's take a picture here. Oh, look at my set there, all illuminated by the flash. If you think that's too much flash, you can dial it down by using flash exposure compensation. What I'm gonna do is, the same button that I used to pop the flash up, I'm gonna hold that down with my thumb. I'm going to press that button with my thumb. Now I can scroll down to exposure compensation, select this, and then lower it. For me, I pretty much always leave the flash exposure compensation at minus one and one third. This will just make your exposure and your pictures a little bit more even. It will blind people a little less, and I find it just generally improves the pictures with this particular type of camera. The built-in flash will take terrible pictures because the flash is just too close to the lens. So everybody's going to have like red eye and everybody's going to look kind of unnatural and overexposed. You can create vastly better flash photography even in dim environments by adding an external flash. Canon is eager to sell you very overpriced Canon flashes and I do not ever recommend getting the name brand flashes. The flashes I'm currently recommending are the Godox flashes. This Godox TT685C has all the same features as the Canon flashes, but it's more powerful, more capable, and it's $110 instead of like four or $500. So check it out at this link here, scp.io slash tt685c. As an added bonus, for like an extra 50 bucks, you can add in a remote trigger that will allow you to move the camera, the flash off camera, and create cool lighting effects like you would in a studio instead of just having on-camera flash. You could move the flash into the other side of the room and bounce it all around, um, filling a room with light no matter how dim it was. That's a really popular technique for pro photographers. Check that kit out at sdp.io slash wireless 685. You can even use the same kit and uh, gradually expand it to add more flashes or add a trigger later. Let's talk about recording video. I already showed you it's pretty easy. You just put the camera into video mode here, and then to record, you hit the camera button here, and it just starts recording. That's pretty easy. And by default, it's gonna pretty much focus on whatever you happen to point the camera at, and that's just fine. That will do for most people, but there are a few options you might want to know about. If I hit the Q button here, the second option down allows me to change the movie recording size. By default, it's set to full HD at what's called 29.97p. It's basically 30 frames a second. It's like almost 30 frames a second. It's just an old broadcast standard that people still use today. That is very good. That is the most common format for places like YouTube or American TV. But there are reasons that you might want to use a different format. For me, I always immediately switch it to full HD 60p, which is 59.94 FPS. But I like 60p. It, it creates a nice smooth video and if you decide to do slow motion you can slow mo things at half pace and it gives you a very cinematic look so that's the first thing i do when i get these cameras and switch them over to that if you are in europe your camera will come configured for pal which shoots at 24 frames per second and that is okay that is what your broadcast TV would be, but you're probably not broadcasting it on TV, right? You're probably putting it up on YouTube or sharing it on social media. And in those places, 30 or 60 frames per second is more common. So if you have a PAL camera, I would immediately switch it over to NTSC. So let's hit the menu button. Go into the wrench icon here, page three, and you'll see video system, the second one down. I'll touch that again, and uh, I can set it to NTSC or PAL. Just switch it over to NTSC and then you'll get those options for 30 and 60 frames per second. If you want to see the audio levels, you can do that. <laughs> Hit the menu button here, go to the shooting menu and under sound recording here, select that. And now I can see the audio levels. If you have it on auto, it's going to be okay. And it will take care of that for you and you don't really have to worry about the audio levels. But if you're serious about sound, if you're hooking up an external mic to improve your sound quality, you're going to want to check those levels. And in fact, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is switch this over to manual because auto levels will crank up the volume in any moments of quiet and that can give you terrible sound. So if you're serious at all about it, definitely switch it to manual and then check those levels and you can see I'm getting red peaks over here. So that's not good. I'm gonna select the recording level and then dial that down until even in my, my maximum volume, it's not peaking, but maybe just going into the yellow. That's kind of where I'm comfortable. So there, I've manually dialed in the right sound recording levels and I'm happy with that. 
You can also activate a digital zoom with this camera in case you zoom in all the way and you want to go even further. So I'll hit the Q button here and as I select digital zoom, you can see it's telling me it's only available at full HD 2997. That's okay. I had set it to 60p, but I will back it off. Now I'm back at 2997. And now if I go in, I can select digital zoom. I can actually zoom in more. So that's without digital zoom. Let's get that focused. That's with digital zoom. Bam. So bang, I just get a whole bunch of extra reach, which is really useful for shooting sports. If you're trying to film your kid and they're on the other end of the field, use that digital zoom. You'll be limited to 30 frames a second, but you can get a lot closer and the results are still going to be really, really high quality. White balance is your, your brain has this way of taking yellow lights like incandescent lights and blue lights like LEDs and making them all look the same. If you remember that like blue and gold dress that went around the internet, the reason people saw it differently is because our brains kind of interpreted the white balance differently. So white balance is this thing that's happening in our brains all the time that we never really think about. And you don't really have to think about it with a camera either, because just like your brain, your camera has auto white balance and it'll take care of things for you almost all the time. If you do find a time when you're taking a picture and everything looks yellow or orange or green and you want to manually set the white balance, I'll show you how to do that. Hit the Q button and then this button there, AWB stands for auto white balance. Now I can just pick the environment that I'm in, tungsten, incandescent, fluorescent, shade, whatever it is. But like I said, most of the time it's going to be auto white balance. If you're in live view mode, it looks almost the same, except that it's now over here. If you don't want to do either one of those things, you can see white balance WB is written right here on the directional pad. So I can just push up. Well, I have to get out of live view mode. I'll push up and then it just takes me to that same place. It's just a shortcut for it. But like I said, it's something you don't generally have to worry about. Metering modes is another thing you usually don't have to worry about. But if you're an old school film camera user and you're like, where's the spot metering on this? I'm going to show you. Everybody else, ignore this. If you love, uh, controlling your metering. Here's the setting for metering. It's hidden right there. Select that. And now I can pick between evaluated metering, which is the default. It's what you should always use. But if you decide you want spot metering, there it is. It just meters off a small part of the middle of the frame, but it's not very accurate. At some point, you're going to fill up the memory card that you have in here and you can reuse it. You could use it a hundred times if you want to. So just unload all your pictures onto your computer then back those up into a cloud service like Google Drive or something so that if you lose your computer, you don't lose your important pictures. Now you can reformat and reuse those, that memory card. To format the memory card, hit the menu button, go to the wrench icon, and then the fourth option down on page one is format card. Select that, click OK, and it's formatted. Now it's clear and you can reuse it all again. Let's talk about connecting this camera to Wi-Fi. You can transfer your pictures directly from the camera to your smartphone or your tablet, not really your PC so much, if you use a Wi-Fi app. So the first thing that you'll do is go into your smartphone, go into your store, iOS, Android, whatever, and search for Canon. You'll find Canon, Canon Camera Connect. Notice it has 2.6 stars. That's not a good rating because it's not a great app. It's kind of flaky, but I will say, I think Canon has the very best app in the industry. It's just nobody has a great app. It's hard to connect a camera to a phone, it turns out. So we'll start by setting up Wi-Fi on the camera. I'll hit the menu button, wrench, page one, and then at the bottom you'll see wireless communication settings. I'm going to go to Bluetooth function, Bluetooth function, and I'm going to select smartphone. And then it will ask you to set up the name of the camera. The default is just fine. Now I'm going to select pairing. I'll select iOS because I'm using an iOS device, but you might be using an Android. And now what I'll do is open up the camera on my smartphone here, and I'm just going to point it at the QR code. This prompt appears and I can just touch that, click open, and it's going to take me over to Canon Camera Connect in the App Store. This should work the same on Android. Now you'll install it or open it. Now that the app is running, I'm going to hit this icon in the upper left corner and I'll hit scan. So now that the app is installed, I'm going to go back to my camera. I'm going to hit the menu button go back into wireless communication settings. I'm going to go back into Bluetooth function and now I'm going to hit pairing and I'm going to pair my camera and my phone. So this time I'm going to select do not display now that I have the app running. Now it's going through the pairing process. Now I can hit the within the app on my smartphone. I'm going to hit the icon in the upper left corner. 
I'll hit scan. There we go. Now it sees my camera, EOS 77D, and it prompts me to pair them. Now my smartphone and my camera are paired via Bluetooth. They should be able to talk when they need to. It doesn't generally use Bluetooth to transfer the pictures because that's kind of a slow process, but it will use this to transfer location information and to start up the Wi-Fi process. So after I select that, I have to go back to my camera here and just verify that, yes, I want that connection just for security reasons. Great. So now the two are completely paired up. Now that they're paired, I only have to do that once. It should remember that forever. So I'm going to go back into the menu here and turn on Wi-Fi, which we'll use to actually transfer the pictures. Menu, wireless communication settings, Wi-Fi settings, Wi-Fi, enable. Select OK. So now that I've enabled Wi-Fi on here, it doesn't start sending out Wi-Fi signals just yet. I need to go back into my smartphone app and use Bluetooth to tell this camera to fire up its Wi-Fi network. I just had to enable it from there first. So now what I'll do is select images on camera, and you can see it wakes the smartphone up. So now it's finding the network and it's trying to connect to the network. On iOS, it automatically prompts me. It should do the same thing on Android. So I'll select join. Now my camera is transmitting a wireless access point, just like your home network, except it doesn't go to the internet. And my phone is connecting it to it. It's going through the connect to camera process and bang. Now I just took three pictures of my Wi-Fi screen. So that's why those pictures are so boring. But you can see those pictures are on there. And if I want to save it to my computer, I can hit this little button in the middle there. And it's saving it to my smartphone. And once it's saved, there we go, it's saved. I can say, go into Instagram, add it, and there the picture is. So it's that easy. Uh, it is very fast after the first time you use it. You know, the second or third time you use it, Wi-Fi will be enabled, Bluetooth will be set up. All you have to do is to go into the Canon app, make sure the camera is on and awake, and then just hit images on camera and it should fire up and allow you to see these pictures right away. One other thing I like to do with the app is to set the camera's time from it. So I'll select camera settings here and then I'll turn on reflect the date time of the smartphone. This will just keep it more accurate. If you travel to a different time zone, it should automatically update it. I find that really, really useful. So be sure to do that and select set to camera. And then you might do this again the next time you land in a different time zone and just make sure that it's taken place. You can also use it for a remote live view shooting. So I can hold the camera out here and hit remote live view shooting and whoa, there you are. You can see my cameraman, Justin, hard at work. Push that shutter button. If I want to focus it, it'll just be just like live view. I'll just touch it here. There we go. And you can see you can change different settings, like whether you're in continuous mode or you have a delayed shutter. Select your different autofocus modes, such as white balance, all sorts of different settings that you can choose to remotely control your camera. And that's how to do Wi-Fi. If you don't want to go through the trouble of connecting Wi-Fi, if you want to transfer raw images, for example, you might decide to get an SD card reader for your smartphone or tablet. So here are links to ones that I've used for Android devices and for iOS devices like iPhones and iPads. You just connect those in, put your SD card in, and the operating system, iOS or Android, will pop up a prompt to import those pictures. Then you can use Lightroom Mobile, which is a very powerful editing app to actually edit raw photos and pull up the shadows and do really amazing things. So again, if you want to check out Lightroom, head to sdp.io slash Adobe deal. You'll be doing Lightroom CC. So now let's talk about some settings that I recommend for this camera, because a lot of the default settings are kind of less than ideal, I think. And the first is shooting raw. Briefly, the camera will take pictures in JPEG format by default. JPEG is how we share pictures on the web. They're highly compressed, but they're kind of low quality. And the camera takes pictures that are far better quality than can even be captured in JPEG. It captures all this beautiful detail in the shadows and overexposed highlights that is immediately lost when it saves the image to a JPEG file. If you're the type who might do some editing on your pictures and you want the best quality possible, I would strongly suggest you shoot in the raw format instead of or in addition to JPEG. If you want to understand everything about this, visit this free video, sdp.io slash rawvjpeg. Sounds like a law case, but it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> Hit the menu button here to set it. Go to the camera, page one. It's the very first menu item. That's how important it is. So I'll select that. And then if I'm just trying out raw, but I want to also shoot JPEG, I'll select raw plus JPEG. If I already know what I'm doing with raw files and I'm using Lightroom or another processor, I'll just select raw and set that to OK. Another setting I always change is 
release shutter without card because by default, if I take the memory card out, the camera will fire up and take pictures. And what this means is sometimes I'll forget the memory card at home and I'll spend an hour taking pictures and then realize, oh, I didn't have a memory card at all. So I always go in and make it so it won't take pictures without the memory card. So at least I know I don't have a memory card in. Again, it's the camera menu, page one, and then you'll see the third option down here, release shutter without card. I'll select that and then I'm gonna set it to disable. So now without the card, it won't take any pictures at all. And at least then you need to go, you'll know that you need to go find a memory card for yourself. I'll also go into ISO expansion and enable some higher ISOs. We talked about ISO a little bit earlier. It doesn't allow you to go too high up by default, but you can expand it. Hit the wrench icon, go to page four here, and then go to custom functions, CFN, touch that again. And then it's CFN two is ISO expansion. I'm gonna turn that to on. So with ISO expansion on, now when I go in and I set the ISO, Before it was limited to ISO 25,600. Now I can go all the way up to ISO 51,200, which is just useful for really, really dim environments, especially if you're shooting JPEG. Your pictures aren't going to be great at that quality, but you don't have to use it. It's nice to just have the option there. Another thing I like to change is the uh, max automatic ISO, because by default, the camera will not choose high ISOs because they can be kind of noisy but it's just going to underexpose your pictures, which doesn't make any sense. So I always go in and change this. Let's go to the shooting menu here, page two. And then this option down here, the next to last one, it says ISO auto max 6400. Let's crank that all the way up to max 25,600. That way if you use auto ISO like I do, and you're in a dim environment, it'll take you up as high as it needs to go. I mentioned earlier the viewfinder display level, but I really like seeing the little display level in the lower left corner. So to review its menu, camera or menu wrench page two viewfinder display electronic level and select show it is turned off by default but it will show a little level icon in the lower left corner notice how it beeps every time you touch the screen like that's that's not necessary right your smartphone doesn't do that that'd be annoying if you want to go in and turn that off hit the menu button go to the wrench icon go to page three and select beep and then select disable now the camera's going to be quiet like it should be. Thank you for doing that. That's really annoying. Uh, you can also control how long the automatic review of pictures happens. Like if I take a picture, it shows it to me for a couple of seconds by default. That can be useful, but sometimes that's too short. Sometimes I want to see it for longer, or sometimes I don't want to see it all because it can take a lot of batteries to do that. So if you want to maximize your battery life, you'll turn that off. To control it, hit the menu button, go to the camera, page one, image review, and instead of two seconds, you could set it to eight seconds, four seconds, or turn it off completely, which is how I normally shoot. After all, if you want to review the last picture, you can always just hit the play button there, and it will pop right up for you. I always go in and set the copyright information. Your pictures, at least in the U.S. and most countries, are automatically copyrighted the moment that you take them, whether or not you add copyright information in. I set the copyright information in um, mostly to help somebody find me if they find a lost camera. So to set the copyright information, go into the menus, hit the wrench icon, go to page four, and then copyright information, one from the bottom, I'll select that. And then you can enter in the author's name and you can see there's a little keyboard here. You can just type your name or you can type my name, whatever name you feel like putting in there. And then select okay. There's some far off hope that somebody would happen to look at that. Uh, you can also enter in copyright details, which you could use to put your email address in. For example, there's, if you hit this little thing in the left corner here, you switch between uppercase, lowercase, and eventually you can find yourself an at if you want to put in your email address. Another thing I like to turn off is the AF assist beam firing. If you're in a dim environment and it's having a hard time autofocusing, it will project the super bright beam out, which will light up the room enough for it to autofocus. But at the same time, it's like telling everybody in the room, hey, this guy is trying to take a picture. So if you're trying to be discreet or if you're taking pictures of a concert or something, it'll be like blinding the performers. I hate AF assist beam firing. So I always go in and turn it off. I'll hit the menu button here. Once again, I'm at the wrench icon, page four, custom functions. Push that again. And now I'm gonna to go to 
custom function number five, AF assist beam firing, and I'm gonna select disable. Now it won't turn on. It's not really a problem. Like usually it'll autofocus in dim environments anyway without it. So why turn it on? Another setting I'd like to suggest is back button focus. Earlier, I showed you that if you want to focus, you push the shutter button halfway and it focuses. And then when you want to take the picture, you push it all the way. That can be useful, except that there are some times when you don't want the camera to focus. For example, if you're taking night photography pictures, sometimes focusing can be really hard. And when you finally do get the camera to focus, you want to take 10 pictures. Well, with this behavior, every time you want to take another picture, it would try to re-autofocus and it would be a real pain. You could switch the lens to manual mode after you get autofocus, but at the same time, that can shake the camera and it's something that you might forget. An easier thing to do is to separate autofocusing from the shutter button so that when you push the shutter button, the shutter button is just for taking pictures and waking the camera up, it doesn't autofocus. When you want the camera to autofocus, you push the AF on button on the back. So therefore, you, you give your thumb a job. Your index finger has a job of taking the pictures. Your thumb has the job of activating the autofocus. For detailed information about why back button focus is meaningful, go to this link, sdp.io slash ybb. I'm going to show you how to turn it on on this particular camera. So I'll hit the menu button here. I'm going to the wrench icon, page four, custom functions, and I'm going to go to custom function 14. This is the custom controls allowing you to control what buttons do what. I'll select the shutter button here. And instead of having it AF, I'm just going to have it start metering. So I'll click OK. So now, when I hit the shutter button, you can hear it's not focusing, right? When I do want it to autofocus, I'll just hit the autofocus button on the back and do that. Generally, the way I'll set this up is with continuous autofocus, continuous shutter, and back button. So that if I want to photograph a still subject, I can hold the AF button on. AF on button down until it acquires autofocus, and then I can let go and take as many pictures as I want. If I'm tracking a moving subject, like somebody running towards me, I will hold the AF on button down the whole time I'm shooting, knowing that it's tracking focus. So it lets you pick between single autofocus and continuous autofocus without actually having to change settings. Sometimes you might get some dust on your sensor. Now, when you take the lens off, what you'll see here is a mirror. This is not the sensor, it's a mirror that bounces light up through the viewfinder. If you see dust in the viewfinder, it's not on the sensor. That means that you have dust on the mirror, or maybe you have dust in the prism here, or maybe there's actually dust back here. But if you turn on live view and you see dust, if you see blotches in the skies in your pictures or something, um, then you have dust on the sensor. And even with the lens off, I'd probably see it here, but this is a new camera, so it doesn't have any dust on it. If you do need to clean the sensor, take the lens off, Hit the menu button, go to the wrench icon, page four, and then select sensor cleaning at the top there. So I'll select that, and then first I'll try the auto cleaning. No, first I'll select clean now. And this will kind of move the sensor around a little bit and hopefully shake any dust off. So you can see it's kind of like, uh, it's doing stuff. If it still doesn't fix your problem, then you can manually go in and clean your sensor by wrench icon, page four, sensor cleaning, and then clean manually. When I select clean manually and click OK, the mirror flips up. That exposes the actual sensor underneath there. Go to stp.io slash clean, and I will show you precisely how to clean it to get all the dust cleaned off and give yourself nice and beautiful pictures again. When you're done, just turn the camera back off, and it'll flip that mirror down to protect it again. And of course, put your lens back on. That's it. That's the whole tutorial. Now I'm going to suggest some lenses, a flash, a tripod, some other accessories that you might want that can help you get even better results. The first thing I suggest is the Nifty 50, the fantastic plastic. This is a $100 lens that can give you beautiful portraits, professional grade portraits that a lot of people use to just blow out the background. Um, pick it up at this link here. It's just, it's the first lens everybody should buy after their kit lens. If you're not satisfied with that. If you want even more background blur, a little more telephoto look, pick up Canon's 85 millimeter F1.8. It will really give you a great background blur. It's about 370 bucks though. Pick it up at this link here. If you're looking for one lens, if you don't feel like changing your lenses, if you're going on a trip and you wanna be ready for anything, get a super zoom. My favorite super zoom for Canon is Canon's 18 to 200 millimeter. It's expensive at 700 bucks, but it's ready for anything. And it's the one lens that can do it all. It, 
going out to 200 millimeters makes it a way more versatile lens than the 55 millimeter maximum lens that you have that probably came with your camera. If you want really sharp results, if you want to make big prints for landscapes and stuff, I'm going to suggest a third party lens, the Sigma 18 to 35 F18. It's 800 bucks and it doesn't have much zoom range, but it's fantastic in low light and it is so sharp. It's way beyond any of the lenses that come with the camera that you can buy from Canon. Even um, pick it up at scp.io s35. The one thing I'll warn you about is that the autofocus isn't great. So you can manage that with landscape photography, but don't plan to use it for action. If you want a super wide angle lens for narrow streets in old European cities or for shooting events or maybe great landscapes in places that have big wide vistas, uh, check out the Canon 10 to 18 millimeter. It's about 280 bucks. You can pick it up at that link there, super wide. And if you're shooting sports or you get more serious about portraits and you want to zoom that can adapt to tight headshots or full body shots, my favorite lens is the Tamron 70 to 200 f2.8 the G2 lens. The G1 lens, also a great lens. You might be able to find a version that's almost like this, but looks a little bit different. Pick it up used and save yourself some money. But for now, the new one is the G2 lens. Pick it up at this link here. It's 1300 bucks, but you will get what you pay for. You'll know it when you pick up that lens. You'll say, this is still a good value. If you want to get into wildlife photography, Canon has the best $1,300 lens that they make. You might even be able to find one new or used for about $800. You can get it cheaper now. Head to sdp.io slash c400. It's a 400 millimeter professional grade lens. I used it professionally for a long time. It produces awesome results. You will be so happy with that lens. If you're looking for a tripod, I'm going to recommend a starter tripod, a $50 tripod, this Dolica tripod. I've had people buy hundreds of these things. Hundreds of people buy one each, but anyway, I've sold hundreds of these things to people and they've been happy with them. They work great. Even if you decide later you want a more expensive tripod, this can still be a great travel tripod for you. So check it out at sdp.io slash Dolica. And finally, I've shown you how to use the buttons and dials on your cameras, but that's like teaching somebody what the steering wheel does in a car or what the gas and the brake do in a car. If I just told you how to drive a car, do you think you'd be good at driving a car? No, because cars require some finesse, right? Driving a car is a little bit science, but it's a lot of art. And photography is the same way. You have to know the buttons and dials, but after that, it's time for you to figure out things like storytelling, mood, lighting, composition. That's what's going to take your pictures from basic to beautiful. So the first thing you should do is check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography. 14 hours of video built into it. So you can read the book, you can watch the videos, or better yet, do a little bit of both. Join our Facebook group, which is free when you buy this book, and people will be there to actually look at your pictures and help you out. There are quizzes at the end of every chapter to make sure that you learned what you were supposed to learn. And there are hands-on practices that you can do to really master photography and get real practice before the moment comes when you absolutely need to take a picture. And inevitably, you're going to start to take dozens, hundreds, thousands of pictures, and you have to organize those photos, be able to find them when you need them, print them, and do some basic and advanced editing. And Lightroom is perfect for that from Adobe. I recommend everybody get Adobe Classic CC, Adobe Lightroom Classic CC, and this book, which has 14 hours of video. Pick it up at stp.io slash store, or just search Amazon for Tony Northup, and you'll find all my books, and you can see reviews there too. Anyway, if you're not happy with it, I'll give you your money back. It's fine. I also have books on Photoshop and my photography buying guide, which goes into deep, intense detail about all the lenses and flashes and studio lighting and tripods that you might want to get in case you're interested in all that gear stuff, as well as like how everything works, like what Moiray is and what an AA filter does. I have all of that. And finally, if you're serious, and you really want to know the art and science of photography, I have an art and science video training series with 10 hours of video where we really cover the stuff that's too intense for the YouTube audience. Once again, subscribe. That's completely free. We'll have lots more tutorials coming out and reviews and stuff. If you have follow-up questions or comments, write it down below, and I'd love to hear just your general thoughts. And if I helped you, then let me know. I appreciate that much. Thanks and bye.